Bueno, como les prometí, ahora van a aprender todo lo que quieren saber y no quieren saber de OFAC. Y tenemos un panel de expertos, incluyendo, y estamos muy agradecidos a OFAC, de venir desde Washington para recibir todas las preguntas acá que ustedes van a tener. Entonces, invito al podio a Monica Peters, de HSBC. Mónica. You have a fan club. Wow, that's fantastic. Carl Fornares from Greenberg Troy. Daniel Cariello from OFAC. Y el moderador, what's your name again? Gabe Caballero from Holland and Knight. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to FIBA, uh, the Asoci La Asociación Bancaria, as well, and HSBC for hosting this event. Uh, today's panel, and, and if you were listening to the previous panel, there was, it was a good segue into how sanctions have, in some ways, uh, intermingled with the world of anti-money laundering and the world of um, anti-corruption. We have an excellent panel. Um, I'm going to let each of the panelists elaborate on their on their individual backgrounds. Uh, but the idea behind the panel is just to go over, you know, general issues, recent events involving um, sanctions compliance and sanctions issues. Uh, we recognize that many of the the participants and the persons in attendance don't necessarily work for U.S. financial institutions, and that some of these laws and sanctions may not necessarily be applicable. However, for many years now, we've, we've come to know what the SDN list is, we've come to know the impact that it has on our correspondence, and now, as we'll talk about, we, we've come to learn and know how sanctions can have a direct impact on non-U.S. financial institutions for either facilitating evading sanctions, or even becoming designated themselves for falling under certain uh, requirements. So I think a good place to start is just to go over some of the recent uh, events in the last couple of years. We've seen significant changes in terms of sanctions enf enforcement. It's no longer only about narco trafficking. It's no, no longer only about uh, terrorism financing. And financial institutions are no longer safe. And the important families of Latin America are at risk. So I, th I think a good, a good place to start would be, Carl, if you could walk us through some of the significant events that have happened in the region and that have impacted the region in the sanction space. Sure, sure Gabriel, thank you. I, I think uh, Gabriel hit the nail on the head that there is significant risk to institutions even that do not have an office, either a branch, an agency rep office, or some subsidiary in the U.S. What A lot of what we see in the press in terms of enforcement uh, is, is, um, is often fines against multinational banks that have an agency or branch or rep office or some type of subsidiary or other operation in the United States. That's what we see typically. But what, um, what, what can happen uh, and ha did happen uh, several times, uh, particularly during the last two years of the Obama administration, um, the U.S. Treasury Department um, did designate two depository institutions, actually three depository institutions, and um, another uh, uh, financial services firm uh, with respect to their alleged role uh, in certain uh, illicit activity. And so just to go through a bit of the timeline here, um, you know, going back to April of 2015, some of you might, might remember uh, 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 Banco Privada de, de Andorra, or BPA, um, was listed not on the, the OFAC SDN list, but as a Section 311 Patriot Act uh, uh, money laundering concern institution. And uh, of course, you know, once that, that bank, which had no U.S. presence, no office, is on that list, 
its correspondent accounts are closed. And it's, it's lifeline uh, to be able to clear dollar denominated or euro denominated or pound sterling denominated or other transactions with their, with their uh, out of country correspondence, it's done. It, and it's done very, very quickly and dramatically. Uh, uh, six months later, uh, the Treasury Department through OFAC for the first time identified and named uh, a bank in Honduras, uh, Banco Continental S.A., uh, as, a, uh, as an SDNTK, a, a specially designated narcotic trafficker affiliated institution. Uh, and uh, that revolved around allegations that the family that, that controlled that institution were allegedly involved in facilitating money laundering for Central American uh, money laundering and drug trafficking organizations. Uh, so that was the first time that had happened. That bank, no presence, nothing in the U.S. Uh, but once the listing takes place, the, uh, their correspondent accounts are closed and the institution is, is effectively finished. Uh, then. You go back another, I think it was uh, seven months later, uh, in, in, this is now going to Panama, uh, the Treasury had, uh, named the Waked Money Laundering Organization and importantly 68 of their affiliated companies. And in many instances, those, some of those companies were not even subsidiaries or even controlled institutions, but they, they had some type of linkage in some way. So you had 68 companies. One of those was the depository institution in Panama. That, that institution, uh, Balboa Bank and Trust, uh, once they were identified uh, as an SDNTK uh, on the list, uh, the same uh, collateral consequence takes place. U.S. correspondent accounts, uh, banks close up their U.S. correspondent account, their lifeline to the United States or, or um, uh, other uh, jurisdictions where they might have correspondent accounts is terminated and it's a kill shot to the institution. Uh, and then last but not least, again, this is during the last two years of the Obama administration, uh, PACnet, a, um, a payment processor and a uh, money service business uh, operating out of Toronto, uh, they were identified as a transnational <coughs> criminal organization and listed on, uh, on the OFAC list, uh, and several of their officers and directors, importantly, were also uh, added to that list in connection with their role uh, with alleged uh, mail fraud schemes. Um, throughout the world. So you had four financial services firms, two depository institutions, that the Treasury Department, either through Patriot Act Section 311, special measures, or by uh, listing them on the, um, the OFAC SDN list, were, were listed and immediately, effectively, put out of business. So those are some of the, um, the very serious um, consequences that can take place. Now, interestingly, over the last two years, um, so uh, the, the, the first two years or so of the Trump administration, we have not seen uh, the Treasury Department um, identify depository, you know, non-U.S. depository institutions or other non-U.S. financial services firms um, on on the, um, on the list. Uh, will that happen? We, we don't know. Is it because it's a change in administration? Um, hard to say, but the authority, the legal authority and the risk is, is out there. And so uh, as, uh, if you are with a, a, uh, an institution that does not have offices in the U.S., uh, the U.S. Uh, authority can still extend. And so it is important that for your compliance programs and the counterparties that you deal with, that you do exercise diligence and ensure that you're not dealing with listed uh, players or, or, or other um, actor, you know, bad actors, including, and I'm going to shift now to the second topic I wanted to discuss, um, which is the Global Magnits Magnitsky Act, uh, is, is actors involved in, in corruption. So when we think of, of OFAC, traditionally we think of, uh, of a person or entity being designated because of, generally speaking, money laundering, narcotics trafficking, terrorism, uh, uh, arms dealing, et cetera. Um, what we think less of is, is corruption or human rights abuse. The, the Global Magnitsky Act, um, which was passed in December of 2016 at the very end of the Obama administration, um, authorizes the president by issuance of executive order 
uh, which, which President Trump did at the end of December 2017. He basically turned on the, the effectiveness of the, of the Global Magnitsky Act and permits Treasury to uh, list or identify actors involved in uh, human rights abuses or corruption. So, so Treasury now has more authority to uh, identify more bad actors in a wider a range of bad acts, not just traditional money laundering or drug trafficking. So as institutions operating in Mexico and elsewhere in the region, it is important as part of diligence to look at actors that might be involved directly or indirectly in corruption because that is something that the current administration very much is targeting. You'll hear more about it with respect to Venezuela and, and, and Cuba. Uh, and, and so the risk lies that, that uh, naming uh, on, on a sanctions list could happen. So just in the last uh, uh, 12 months or so, um, uh, under the, the Global Magnitsky Act, we have seen, for example, the, uh, the Treasury Department uh, identify actors in among other countries, but I'm focusing on this region, uh, uh, an individual in the Dominican Republic, uh, two, three individuals in, in Nicaragua, and going outside of, uh, of, of the um, of the region, uh, the assassination of the of the uh, Washington Post opinion writer uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, approximately 17 uh, Saudi individuals were identified uh, uh, under this new authority as uh, as participants that engage in human rights abuse. So uh, again, as uh, for uh, risk managers in the region. Uh, pay attention not just to the traditional money laundering uh, risks, but also thinking out of the box and looking at, at corruption and, and human rights abuse as, as those are um, items of, uh, of importance for the current administration. So that's what I had. So Carl, Carl hit on a couple of issues, right, in terms of some of these designations in the Continental, which was associated with the Rosenthal family in Honduras and Joaquin in Panama, uh, we have a, co a couple common attributes. Well-known families in country, very diverse businesses, right, including financial institutions within the group, a lot of cash-intensive businesses, so a lot of distribution, a lot of import and export within their family lines. And in the case of Rosenthal, we had a former, uh, you know, PEP or a PEP. Uh, so we had potential ties to the government, corruption issues. And in the Waked uh, instance, we have a company whose, whose core business is in the duty-free space, uh, garnering concessions in many of the airports in the region. Again, dealing with governmental authorities. So when we're looking for risk, you know, concentrating on some of those issues, potential corruption, cash intensive businesses. Um, an institution like yours, Monica, is, you know, it's global, you have a significant US presence, obviously you've implemented global standards across your different affiliates, but what are some of the things that non-US financial institutions that are not necessarily subject to OFAC sanctions, what are the, some of the things that they should be looking at when developing their programs to mitigate OFAC risk? Sure. So I think it's important to mention that the landscape in the region has changed significantly with respect to sanctions. So if you look a few years back, we were really talking about SDN relationships, Cuba nexus, right? Now we're talking about a region that has two countries that are subject to sanctions and, and substantial sanctions. So you have Cuba and Venezuela. Um, in addition to a number of designations outside of just your traditional narcotics trafficking designations that we're, we're used to seeing. Um, so I know Carl mentioned the Magnitsky designations, but in addition with the Venezuela program, we've seen a significant number of designations of some very large entities that operate within region. Um, I think that where we in Latin America have, have struggled with implementation on some of this stuff is really a lot of the conflict of law issues that we face. And I think that sometimes that goes a little it's not necessarily as recognized as much in the U.S. as it probably should be, right? Um, so 
one of the issues that we focus on is irrespective of whether the fact I'm a U.S. bank or not, which HSBC is not a U.S. bank, um, I still have an obligation to comply with certain OFAC requirements so that I'm not causing a violation to my U.S. affiliate. And that's really key for most foreign banks operating in region as well. Um, making sure that you're implementing controls to not just comply with your local laws, but also implementing controls that to the extent you have operations, correspondent relationships, affiliate relationships outside of the region, that you have controls to make sure that you're not causing your affiliate or your correspondent who's located in the United States to violate U.S. sanctions. So that's something as well that's an important theme because OFAC can also uh, penalize foreign entities for causing a violation to a U.S. entity, and that tends to get overlooked in region. Um, I think key in region, and one of the things that, that we've really focused on is implementing controls to ensure that we're able to detect that activity where I am by law unable to restrict an account, unable to close an account, unable to block an account, and how I can prevent that activity from potentially going outside of country where I may cause a violation to another jurisdiction. Um, I think it's also knowing your customer. It sometimes gets a little bit underrated especially when it comes to some of our larger clients, but Latin America faces risks not just with respect to SDNs, but in some of the southern cone countries, so Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, where you have large commodities exports, you are seeing a lot of commodities going to sanctioned jurisdictions. So not just going to Cuba, Venezuela, but also going to Iran and Syria. And so how we are working with our clients to make sure that our clients understand what their potential obligations are as well. So if I have a agricultural grain exporter in Argentina, making sure that that client understands that to the extent you're exporting to Dubai and those goods are going to be further going to Iran and you'll be receiving payment in U.S. dollars, that that's something from a sanctions perspective that we have to evaluate so as to make sure that we're not causing violation to any correspondent or affiliate relationships. So I think that's one of the, the, the two big areas that we tend to focus in a lot in Latin America and we tend to also struggle with as well because I think sometimes they get to get a we get focused on a lot of the designations that we see obviously in country um, and, and not necessarily thinking about the wider picture and the additional risks that we face in, in region. You touched upon, uh, you know, know, know your customer, uh, due diligence and things like that. I think some of the issues that the, we, we all struggle with in complying with these sanctions or mitigating risk is, how do you deal with uh, a client or a customer that may not necessarily be, or a counterparty that's not necessarily designated on the list, but has some type of commercial relationship or is owned or controlled by a designated person? And there's a concept uh, you know, that OFAC has issued in, 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 in prior guidance. It's often referred to as the 50% rule. Um, you know, Daniel, can you elaborate a little bit about on, on how that rule works? what the effect of, of uh, you know, someone that's designated on the list uh, that has a, a prop proprietary interest in, a, in another entity or a subsidiary, how does that work in the sanctions regime and, and what are some of the things that OFAC is looking at on, on some of those interactions? Right, so in short, the 50% the rule essentially uh, recommends that, or states rather, that if you're, um, an entity that is owned or controlled 50% or more by a designated party or person, that the same prohibitions that apply to that, especially designated national, for example, also apply to that entity, regardless of whether or not that entity is on the SDN list that OFAC publishes. Um, and so that can be a real challenge for the industry, as you probably already know, because um, especially in the Russia context and in other sanctions programs, um, you know, the, the ownership structure can get really complex and it's really difficult to kind of know, um, you know, what party is owned by who and it changes quite frequently. Um, so having knowledge of um, ownership is really helpful in determining whether or not current customers have any relationship, uh, especially 50% or more, with a designated person because the same uh, prohibitions apply. So um, this also does apply in the Russia context for the sectoral sanctions identifications entities list of uh, uh, persons. Um, these persons are not necessarily blocked by operational law, but there are conditional prohibitions that apply to certain types of transactions. So 
For example, if you have an entity that is subject to Directive 1 or, um, pursuant to Executive Order 13662, um, the conditional prohibition related to the issuance of equity um, would, uh, and debt would also apply to entities that they own or control 50% or more. Um, again, we understand that it's a complex, complex, complex issue, but I think you know, considering how to weave in um, gathering that knowledge in compliance programs is really helpful in, in, in having you know, transparency with your customers, even if they're not necessarily uh, uh, upfront with that. And, th and there's some, some real tough issues that come about when you identify that there's a designated person that has some type of relationship with, with a sanctions person. Um, you have situations sometimes where maybe the individual doesn't own the entity or own 50% or more of the entity, but they sit on the board or they're the president of the entity. Uh, you have other instances where you have, you mentioned the Russia program, the Venezuela sanctions program, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's very similar to the, uh, the sanctions regime we have for Ukraine and Russia, where you have these governmental entities that are the focus. Um, when you have, you're dealing with an SDN, uh, you know, maybe, you're, I don't know if you've heard of the, uh, the Exxon Mobil case, that was an enforcement action uh, a few years back involving the Russia sanctions. Um, perhaps, a, I'd love to hear the panel's comments on dealing with some of those situations, the Exxon Mobil case, what are some of the best practices on how to deal with, maybe they don't own 50% or more, maybe they own 10%, maybe they sit on the board, maybe they're a director, I'd love to hear what the panel thinks on, on, on how to approach those instances. So I'll start since I'm the only one at the bank. <laughs> um, I think so much of it is about your bank's risk appetite, right? Bank's risk appetite and your local law. Um, you know, HSBC's made it very clear that our tolerance for that type of stuff is very low. Um, so it's really how you, and again, going back to everybody's favorite word, de-risk your portfolio where it comes to that type of exposure. Um, but I think similarly too, there are scenarios where you don't necessarily have the ability to de-risk. So a good example that we have in that a number of banks are dealing with in, in this room is the designation of Bandas Uruguay. Um, so Bandas is, is a large bank in Uruguay that has a retail presence as well um, and commercial presence. And so from a operating within the Uruguay market, we can't necessarily say, Bandas Uruguay, I'm not going to do business with you. So it's finding a way to, to where we know that Bandas is, is a prohibited entity to implement controls to make sure that I'm not going to prevent, or I'm not going to have money from Bandas Uruguay go outside of the country, especially where you're talking about a country that has a significant U.S. dollar activity in the market. And so um, it, a lot of that is, goes back to screening controls, which people were talking about, and whether that be real-time screening, post-settlement screening, where you identify triggers in your post-settlement screening, how you're dealing with clients who are making that, those transactions and how you're having those discussions with the clients to either ensure that they understand what the risk is um, or under, uh, ensure that they understand what their potential obligations are. Yeah, I, I think I, I would add to that is uh, you know, certainly you know, many of the banks here provide, provide credit and loans uh, to other companies within the region. Uh, it's important to have um, um, ironclad representations and warranties that are uh, U.S. sanctions uh, 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 context and related uh, so that at least the institution shows that it, it, it looked at it from a contractual perspective and if, if there was false information provided it can at least rely on that as a defense. But independent of getting good representations and warranties, it's important that the institution as part of the credit underwriting that it does thorough due diligence and understands uh, uh, not just who the actual uh, borrower entity is, but understand who all the direct and indirect beneficial owners are. Uh, and uh, as well, um, it's important to look at the officers and directors. Um, that We saw that happen with, with the Waked situation. When you had 68 companies that got listed, um, the issues then came up, well, well, all of those directors and all of those officers on all of those 68 companies, how does that affect the fact that we have a credit outstanding to them? And as a, as a non-U.S. company, are we subject to OFAC risk if we accept the repayment? Uh, or do we, uh, do we ask that they be extricated and removed from the board or, from, or they renounce their officer position? What, what if they have a dual U.S. citizenship? 
um, and they have a U.S. passport. So I think these are, these are, there are no easy answers to these questions, but it's important why at the outset on the underwriting process is that a very thorough documentation and review be done. No, don't take anything for granted in, in terms of the background of all the individuals, in terms of the top tier uh, direct and indirect ownership, and importantly, the officers and directors. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a couple sanctions program that we can look to for guidance. If you look at the Iran uh, sanctions program, there's a couple factors that are referenced in the regulations in terms of when you're dealing with an SDN potentially, right? And, and we learned this from the Exxon Mobil case. Um, if you're entering into an agreement with an entity who's not itself designated, but let's say their president is a designated person, we saw that in the Exxon Mobil case. You know, OFAC has issued guidance indicating that that SDN, even though they're not acting in, the, in their personal capacity, they're acting in their professional capacity, there's an interest in the transaction. And we saw ExxonMobil get a, um, you know, a fine and a penalty for that. And this issue becomes much more apparent in the sanctions programs that are, that are out there for Venezuela, where there's these sectoral sanctions that are in place with respect to the government of Venezuela, but at the same time, you have individuals that have been designated within the regime. So you're dealing with a portion of the government on a certain transaction, and it might be fine from a sectoral sanctions perspective, but if you're negotiating an agreement with the, you know, the governor of one of the, the states in Venezuela that has been designated, or you're negotiating an agreement with the president of PDVSA and that individual has been designated, there's an SDN interest in that transaction. So it's, it's a really complicated um, issue that, that we should all be wary of. Um, that's a good segue to something that's, I think, kept us all very busy for the last uh, two to three years is Venezuela. Um, Monica, if you could walk us through some of the, the, the high-level sanctions and some of the issues you're seeing with respect to that sanctions program. Sure. So, as hopefully most of you know, um, a few years ago, the U.S. Sanctions, or U, U.S. Treasury Department implemented sanctions to, uh, in Venezuela that were mostly related to debt and equity provisions for the government of Venezuela. Um, where the program became more complicated, and it, it, some of it mirrored what we saw in Russia, I think Venezuela has been a lot more challenging um, for us in the sense that the way that the U.S. government has defined the government of Venezuela is broad in nature. So in the Russia context, we saw entities being listed who U.S. Treasury Department was telling us, you cannot deal in new debt or equity involving these uh, entities based on a certain number of, uh, of days for, for maturity. Um, in the Venezuela context, we received an EO that said, anybody that's considered government of Venezuela as defined in these scenarios, you can't deal with certain debt and equity within the defined timelines. Okay. So that was challenge number one that I think we had in Venezuela, and I think that continues to be a challenge. And going back to some of the points that we were talking about with the 50% rule, you're also talking about entities that have very complex structures. You're talking about uh, some government entities, some which are part of development organizations in Latin America, some of which have a stakeholdership in an in, in entity, in a state-owned entity, in a different jurisdiction outside of Venezuela. So that's made, made the challenges of Venezuela Salem more complicated. I think subsequently this year we saw a significant ramp up in the program for Venezuela that's been particularly challenging with the designation of PDVSA, um, the designation of Banco Central, and then as I mentioned earlier, the designation of Vandes. Government of Venezuela entities, um, you know, you're looking at a 30-day maturity period. So they deliver product and they have to get paid within 30 days, otherwise it's a prohibited extension of credit. Another thing that the executive orders uh, also mention is in the language that they use, maybe Carl, you can provide a little co color on these things. They include language like acting on behalf of the government of Venezuela, causing a violation, and then you have the evasion and conspiracy. Can, can you yeah. provide a little color on yeah, that? So, yes, yeah, so you have to look at, and with Venezuela, you have to look at uh, agents, uh, uh, contracted parties, uh, and, and look to see what their relationships are, see if there's in interlocking directors, if there's individuals that are named and that are on the board of some of these um, companies that are acting as agents. Uh, I, I think Venezuela is probably one of the trickiest 
sanctions programs that OFAC has because it, it isn't, um, it, it's, I, I think it, it is almost you know, very surgical in its approach and it's been, it's been um, uh, evolving with the fact situation in Venezuela. And it's, it's, it's a bad situation that has gotten exponentially worse over the last two to three years. Um, so we started seeing the first of these sanctions involving, involving debt issues and equity issues, uh, I think it was about four years ago. Um, and now you're, you're seeing almost weekly might be a bit of an exaggeration, but right. very frequent designations coming up. And then, um, so, so in, your, in, in terms of looking at a potential transaction, you have to look at not just whether the person is obviously named or not, but again, and, and we've, this is a recurring theme, look at their officers, look at their directors, look at the indirect ownership, and see if there are any ties to any named individuals. And you, can, you, can you provide a little bit of color on, you know, some of the issues that OFAC seeing with respect to the Venezuela sanctions, I'm sure there's a very, very long uh, general license or specific license request list. Where, where is the focus and, and can you talk a little bit about the objective of the Venezuela sanctions and what, what's trying to be accomplished? Yeah, I mean, so uh, a lot of the questions that we're receiving lately uh, are primarily um, related to timing, which, which is articulated in the sectoral sanctions details. Um, one thing to note is that, um, and this kind of applies to all sanctions programs, when you're looking at um, you know, what OFAC is considering for designations and how to treat particular prohibitions, always go back to the executive orders where, where the details laid out. And then there are accompanying FAQs and interpretive guidance that sort of provide additional detail to, to understand exactly what the intentions are for the agency with respect to certain executive orders. Um, so. Um, Back to my point about timing, though, I think that because there's so many sort of layers to that program, it's important to have really good record keeping to understand exactly when a transaction is initiated, um, what the expectation for the, um, you know, the credit terms are, and so on. And, um, you know, that will kind of give you a clearer picture of whether or not a particular transaction is permissible. Um, because if you don't have that information or it's not clear to you, um, and you just because you don't have the knowledge, you just assume it's fine. Um, that will not play a role in terms of supporting you in an investigation. So, um, as far as uh, the future goes, I think you know there's not much we can really s say or speculate in terms of where we're going with this. It is a targeted program um, that has very complex sectoral sanctions. Um, you know, there's there's um, at this point no uh, you know um, you know we're not going in the direction of a comprehensive program where pretty much everything is blocked or prohibited, um, but um, you know, ultimately, I think fall, falling back on those executive orders, the details of those executive orders, and going to our frequently asked questions for additional information related to those orders um, is really the best source of information to understand exactly what we're going for. Looking at some of the, the recent designations, we've seen a Russian bank, Eurofinance, get designated uh, for engaging in certain transactions with the government of Venezuela. We see a very clear uh, line of demarcation for the Maduro regime, which is now embedded within the definition of government of Venezuela, and the regime, the Guaido regime, and the Asamblea, which is recognized by the U.S. government as the legitimate uh, governing authority in Venezuela. So it's kind of inter interested in hearing from, from Monica and Carl in terms of trying to think ahead and mitigate risk. We've seen all these designations. We've seen certain uh, non-Venezuelan parties get designated for doing some business with the government of Venezuela or the Maduro regime. If, if you're trying to isolate risk, what are you looking at? You know, what, what sectors, what areas of the economy, what parties are you looking at as, okay, these could be next or we need to, you know, subject these, these counterparties to enhance due diligence? Monica, maybe you can chime in on that. Sure. So uh, I think there's two buckets. There's the bucket of your clients where you know they're doing transactions with Venezuela, whether that be directly or indirectly through, let's say, a distributor. And then there's the other bucket where your client hasn't necessarily said, I do business with Venezuela, but you know based off of transactional activity that things are going to Venezuela. Um, I think having that kind of view in the first instance in any sanctions program is really critical to anticipating future changes and reacting quickly to future changes. Um, I, I, 
think that for Venezuela, my hope is that it stays with actors who we think are facilitating activities. So looking to see where you potentially have uh, individuals or entities who have relationships with the government of Venezuelan uh, actors, um, looking to see where potentially maybe you have clients exporting into the, into Venezuela directly. Um, my my guess is that it will be more towards the direction of entities that are facilitating a movement of oil, particularly from yeah. Venezuela. So if you have um, clients as well that operate in the oil sector, I think focusing on those areas, and, and, and I think that's probably the best way to ensure that when we do have a change in the sanctions, what, whatever that may be, that you're able to react quickly and implement those controls quickly because you already know what that population of customers is or which customers you need to go to immediately first to put those controls in place, have those discussions, limit certain transactions, what have you. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I think the petroleum sector is obviously the key sector. Uh, suppliers, parts, manufacturers, you have to keep a particular eye on those, but with respect to Venezuela generally, I think all it should be considered enhanced due diligence, and one has to be extremely cautious in dealing with any Venezuela transaction just because of the nature of the sanctions program and how, how sort of surgical it is that there are parts of it that are very narrow, there are parts of it that are, that are broad. I, I think that this is this is not going away anytime soon. This is going to continue um, uh, to be to get uh, a bad situation, an already very bad situation, continuing to get worse. Uh, and you'll see the U.S. government continue to come out with these incremental uh, additions to the sanctions program. And so, for institutions, look, there are many transactions that are perfectly lawful, many perfectly lawful Venezuelan transactions. Um, but but the, uh, the the danger is is getting into a tra transaction that is uh, for U.S. purposes is is viewed to be um, unlawful. I think you both talked about kind of doing an impact assessment, and I think that's a that's a very good approach to any new significant change in any sanctions regime. Right? Is at least in Venezuela, okay, the immediate exposure is at the government level, right? So I think within your institution, do I have any government of Venezuela? on my books? Do I have any outstanding loans or credits directly or indirectly involving the government of Venezuela? Then I think that next bucket is PEPs, right? Okay, what PEPs do I have that are government of Venezuela PEPs? Because again, who, who's at risk of future designation, future sanctions? It's going to be there. I think the tougher thing is, is what you, you alluded to is that indirect government of Venezuela exposure where you're dealing with a customer that you know, as an exporter in the region, and they, they may not even export directly to Venezuela. They may have distributors in different areas that in turn um, export to Venezuela, or they facilitate uh, exports outside of Venezuela. So definitely a, uh, an evolving area. Um, and, and Gabe, one, one more thing um, from Venezuela is also watch out for dual citizenships. Yeah. I think we've seen a lot of persons that have, have been listed, yeah. um, have gotten creative, and, and, and uh, uh, obtained second and even third citizenships, third passports, uh, as an attempt to open accounts within institutions that are unsuspecting. So that's something as part of diligence when you're dealing with an individual that, uh, that has resided in Venezuela is to, to look at, at their citizenships. Yeah. That, that's also an issue in, in evaluating a, a transaction, whether or not it's, you know, whether or not it has a U.S. nexus to it, because it, I, we often find within our own institutions, within the boards or some of our, our clients, um, there's U.S. persons that may have dual citizenship. So as a U.S. person, you know, you may be working for a non-U.S. entity that is not necessarily subject to OFAC jurisdiction, but if you're involved in a transaction that's prohibited by sanctions, that's a violation of law as an individual. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it happen with the, um, the Continental and the WACAD yeah. designations where they had very common uh, structures in Latin America where you have a couple of very important families that they do a joint venture on a project. It might be a development, it might be a mall, it might be something else. Some of those family members are, have dual citizenship. And so you have an SDN on the other side of the transaction, or you're a U.S. person, you, you, you got to comply with these sanctions. So th there's some tough issues there. Um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit the trend um, 
of where sanctions are going. And, and again, Carl, you touched upon it at the beginning, where it's not just money laundering, it's not just narcotics trap. We're seeing a focus on corruption, and we're seeing a focus on human rights abuses. There's some recent uh, young sanctions programs. There's one for Nicaragua, um, and we mentioned Magnitsky earlier. Can, can, can you talk a little bit, Carl, about that, that new focus on corruption, you know, how close some of these executive orders are to each other, and they're, they're really focused on corruption? Yeah, well, I think in the U.S., uh, uh, for most of the Obama administration, well, let, let's go back. During the Carter administration, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was passed, but the, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which, which many folks here are, are aware of, um, that was I say, reserved for you know, very large uh, cases involving U.S. multinational companies. And then during the Obama administration, actually even going back to the Bush administration, we saw a ramp up in FCPA enforcement around 04, 05, and then into the Obama years, it, it really increased, um, where you were going after many U.S. institutions um, uh, active in the region. What was not picked at were non-U.S. people, non-U.S. people corrupt actors. And so this, that's where the, um, the Global Magnitsky Act has come in and has given the Treasury Department this, this new authority. And so when, when you look at OFAC, I think you have to also look at enforcement priorities of the Department of Justice, right? Because this is all coming up to White House policy in terms of the tone that is looking to be set uh, around the world or in the region, whatever it is. And so we, we've seen now how uh, any corruption, which I think has been a fight reserved for any corruption against U.S. companies, and now it has morphed uh, over the last couple of years during the Trump administration into a fight against uh, uh, global corruption, uh, non-U.S. Uh, players. Um, we saw that with, uh, uh, with the FIFA case, right, where you had multiple, uh, uh, these are non-public officials, you know, private individuals um, engaging in, in or trying to uh, influence uh, the outcome of, of decisions on soccer, uh, television rights contracts, individuals with, with no U.S. Uh, uh, nexus, no U.S. citizenship. We saw many of them get, get prosecuted, many of them saying, how could that be possible? I'm not a U.S. person. And yet you saw them uh, get, get, get prosecuted under this, this new um, uh, uh, enforcement uh, priority to go after those types of actors. So I, I think in terms of the future of sanctions compliance, again, we're, we're not just looking at the traditional uh, buckets of, of bad acts, of, of, of money laundering or, or, or narcotics trafficking, but going into, into, um, into corruption and, and human rights abuses. Yeah. I think uh, we just want to touch quickly on Cuba. Um, Daniel, if you could just high level, I know there's been some announcements, if you could summarize those and let us know what if we can expect anything or what, what's out there right now. Yeah, so there, uh, just to back up, I think uh, when there are announcements regarding sanctions programs, they're not always necessarily um, you know, uh, sent out by the Treasury Department. I, I sort of view our agency as the sort of technical implement, uh, implementers of the sanctions policy. Um, so you know, we're conducting investigations, we're um, articulating policy that's been crafted across, you know, in consultation with multiple agencies, particularly the State Department. So the, the recent changes announcement, um, uh, announcements rather, have been um, put out there by the U.S. Department of State. Um, so if there are no sort of changes codified in regulations or in a new executive order, which the U.S. Department of Treasury would also publish as well, um, there's not much we can really speak to in terms of what's changed because technically nothing has at this point. Um, but what I can say is that um, you know uh, it, it is important to sort of read through the press release that they've that they've um, put out there from the State Department to get a general sense of maybe some of the direction that we're going. But ultimately, um, any changes related to the financial sector with respect to this particular uh, sanctions program um, will be detailed through Treasury's website once it's codified. Um, so. Uh, look at the State Department's press release uh, site as well as OFAC's recent actions were the sort of official 
um, announcement for changes will take place. Yeah. And just a couple, couple segues as to that, that announcement by uh, Advisor Bolton. Um, they, they suggested that there may be some changes in remittances and potentially putting limits again. Uh, they, they removed uh, in, in years past uh, a lot of the personal remittances to Cuba. Um, and we've seen uh, over, since Trump took office, we've seen um, the creation of a Cuba restricted list uh, where there's certain governmental entities that, uh, you know, are, are listed on that list. And so, you know, it's difficult to say right now, but you could see an expansion of some of the parties or names on that list. But basically right now it's state cognizant of, of changes on the Cuba side because they're coming. Um, another thing on the Cuba side that I think is important is, you know, when we talk about the Cuba sanctions and the quote unquote embargo, there's a key law called the Helms Burden Act. Had many provisions uh, and gave a lot of authority to the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State, and the President to impose certain um, sanctions or embargoes against the government of, of Cuba. Uh, one of the provisions in the Helms Burden Act, Title III, um, allowed for certain uh, claims against the government of Cuba or private parties for expropriation of property or unauthorized use of property. Um, Carl, if you could summarize briefly, you know, what, what this Title III uh, implementation is and what are some of the issues that you're seeing uh, relating to it? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not active with respect to that, uh, with, with Title III, uh, but um, yeah, like at our law firm, we do have a group uh, that, that handles uh, cases where individuals, and I believe you, you as well at, at your firm, um, handle cases where uh, uh, individuals that had property uh, confiscated um, uh, by the Castro regime um, going back to 1959-1960 um, have the ability to assert claims um, in the U.S. Uh, uh, federal court and obtain a judgment against the Cuban government. And so uh, for the last several years there has been uh, legislation which has been um, essentially deferred uh, in terms of the effectiveness and now uh, President Trump has has made that um, effective, uh, and um, I believe, Gabe, uh, we have talked about this, but I, I believe um, uh, some uh, uh, um, I don't know if a claim has already been filed. Yeah, there's there's um, so there, there's already a lawsuit that's been filed uh, by a group of individuals in in South Florida, um, filing against the operator of a port in Cuba. This is a private party against a private party for unauthorized, um, you know, basically use of what was once their property. So at a very high level, you know, we're, we're working with a lot of clients that um, since the expansion of, of uh, you know, certain activities that you can now do with Cuba um, during the Obama years, we saw airlines, cruise lines, uh, port operators, companies in the infrastructure space, telecommunications, start looking at Cuba again to do certain activities. A lot of them are potentially operating on, on property that was once, uh, you know, property of individuals that, that may have been U.S. persons. So, you know, we've been advising clients on the legal risks associated with that. Uh, we've also been approached by some parties seeking to make claims against uh, certain other, other parties that are operating in Cuba. There's been a big focus on the non-U.S. persons, so non-U.S. companies, some of the Canadian companies, the European companies uh, that are operating in the touristic sector in Cuba, we've seen some, some action there. So from, from your perspective, understand that you know, if you're underwriting a, a loan or a credit to a very well-known hotel operation group or some, some company in the touristic space, you know, and they have a significant Cuba exposure, you, you want to consider this because you may have some third party claims that could impact uh, your underlying credit or some of your, your diligence. Um, I want to jump just to open Q&A. So, you know, to the extent any, anybody in the audience um, has any questions for the panel, we'd, we'd love, to, love to hear them. So, huh? okay, well, lunch is next. So I think that's the first time we finished the panel early. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. Um, David, 
Diego, what's next? On to lunch. Yeah.